All righty. Let's open our Bibles to Revelation chapter 8. Actually, chapter 7. We're going to do the questions first. Before we continue in our study through Revelation, let's take a moment and go to our Heavenly Father in a word of prayer. Let's pray. Our dear Lord and our ever-loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for the mercy that you've shown to us. We thank you, dear Lord, for your grace. And we thank you for your love. Heavenly Father, we thank you for sending Jesus to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins to make the reconciliation with you possible and to be able to give us entrance into the kingdom and into eternity with you in heaven. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for its teachings that helps us to be strong and shows us how to walk within your light. We pray that as we go through this study that we will be able to strengthen our faith and our courage in our continued striving to overcome. Heavenly Father, we pray for those who are sick this morning, those who are unable to be with us due to issues such as illness and other challenges that they're facing within their physical health. We pray that if it be your will, that they'll be returned back to the fullest portion of their health. These things we pray in your son's name, amen. All right, let's take a second and quickly walk through the questions from chapter 7, then we'll continue then into chapter 8 of Revelation. So who or whom did John see standing at the four corners of the earth? Four angels, that's right, four angels. What was the number of those who were sealed? 144,000. Whom did John see standing before the throne and before the Lamb? Exactly, there in verse 9, a mass or a great multitude from every tribe, nation, and tongue upon the earth. Who, fall, who fell down on their faces and worshipped him? That's right, you have the, the, all that stood around the throne, you have the elders, four living creatures, that's right. Um, as well as, um, no that's it. And fell on their faces for the throne and worshipped God. Who, so who asked John? Who were these arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? That's right. One of the elders. And what would God wipe away? All tears. That's right. All right. So that being said, let's go ahead and continue forward now into chapter 8. Now, a couple of weeks back, we went ahead and looked at the first part of chapter 8 that contains... The sixth, sorry, the seventh seal. So let's go ahead and just read that as by way of reminder, and then we'll continue forward, having already looked at this seventh seal. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Then another angel, having a golden censer, came and stood at the altar. He was given much censer that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints um, upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense and the prayers of the saints ascended before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar and threw it to the earth. And there were noises, thunderings, lightnings and an earthquake. So the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared themselves to sound. Now, there is one phrase I want to bring in for today's study because it kind of helps us understand in part, if you would, the, in part, the cause of the warnings that are about to be issued. And that phrase is to be found there in verse number three. What do you think that phrase is? Especially if we were to use maybe the wrath of God coming because of vengeance 
what would be the cause for that vengeance? Yeah, look, look at there in verse 3 there. He was given much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar, which was before the throne. There's a reason why. As we saw in chapter 5, I believe it was, in the throne room scene, the prayers of the saints beneath the altar, there's a reason why we now see the prayers of the saints coupled with the incense. And this incense and the prayers of the saints are going to be put into the censer and it's going to be lit on fire and it's going to be thrown down to the earth. And the result of that is going to be noises, thunderings, lightnings, and an earthquake. And the trumpets begin to sound. So I think there is a direct connection with the persecution that his people, both under the Old Testament, when you think about the faithful, the prophets of old, um, and couple that with, with the way his apostles were treated while he was upon this earth, his disciples being treated after he ascended into heaven, the persecution, all of these things are the prayers of the saints crying out to God. And what we see here appears to be the beginning of the seven trumpets that are going to sound the warning of God's vengeance upon them. Now, what other passage in the New Testament do we see that makes a direct connection of vengeance belonging to the Lord? Okay, that's not what I'm thinking about. We're not in tuned yet this morning, so pay attention a little bit. <laughs> that's not a bad answer, though. Romans 12. Okay. Romans chapter 12, beginning there in verse 9. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians, this is a very good point. You look at chapter 1 and the, the wrath of God upon those who know not the gospel nor obey, obey the gospel. Yeah. Uh, but specifically what I'm thinking about is Romans chapter 12. And the connection we're going to make is the, is the following. Look there in verse number 9 of Romans 12. He begins the section by saying, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. Now, Coming down there in the text, specifically there in verse 19, and really all of this kind of goes together in the way that Christians treat other people as much as lies within you, be at peace with all men, um, have regard or repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things inside of all men. Then verse 19, beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Okay, look at that phrase, do not avenge yourselves. He's talking to the Christians here in Rome. Do not avenge yourselves. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't matter if the government comes upon you, if it's the Jewish leaders coming upon you, if it's your association with the, the, the Jewish people because of your, your belief in the Messiah. You know, whatever it may be in regards to worship God, do not avenge yourself. That's not your place. All right. And then he says, but rather give place to wrath. Where is that place? Or who is that place, really? It's God, okay? Again, this is Romans chapter 12, verse 19. But rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Now, your Bible probably has a little footnote there to verse 19. When it makes a statement, where does it point back to? Probably Leviticus or Deuteronomy. Because ultimately, the vengeance of God's people, or vengeance on behalf of God's people, belongs in the hands of God, not in his people. When you think about David and several of the Psalms, um, David would pray that God would judge his enemies. And we would think, okay, he's praying for vengeance, that God would immediately smite the enemies dead. But what David is praying for is something that is much more complex than simply the Lord striking his enemies dead. He's wanting the Lord to judge him. Now, here's the beauty of that. If the Lord judges them and they repent, does the Lord see that? Absolutely. Think about it. Jump forward to Saul. You know, imagine the Christians hearing about, um, you know, um, sorry, James has been put to death. Peter's thrown into prison. Stephen has now died. And there's this man, this Jew, probably a potentially high up Jew in the Jewish council or the Sanhedrin council. He's going around and he's arresting people. 
So what do you think the Christians may have been praying for? God, take vengeance on this man called Saul. But when we pray for God's vengeance, what we're praying for is his judgment. And his judgment is perfect. So when such a person that that we are thinking, I'm going to leave vengeance up to God, and that person repents, we have to accept the fact he's repented, he's changed. God sees that as well. That's why we're not good judges in regards to those matters. So God is. And so Saul is a great example of that. So that's why when we come back to what we're looking at here, vengeance is not upon us. Do not avenge yourselves. I should say the right to avenge is not upon ourselves. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And so he talks about, therefore, here's how that translates into our life. If your enemy's hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you'll heap coals of fire on your head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with what? With good. Okay. So when we throw this back then to what we're looking at here, same thing applies. The prayers of the saints are crying out. And so the Lord's vengeance is going to be just. It is going to be right. And it'll be true. Right. <clears throat> Did you forget it? No, I didn't forget okay. it. I thought you looked at Haley and forgot what you said. Haley wanted to make a comment, but she was scared to make a comment. So I was trying to talk to <laughs> You know, Haley, I would, I would appreciate your comment for sure. <laughs> That's what I tried to tell her. I was just going to say there's a lot of comfort in that, knowing that we don't have to do anything. Yeah. You know, it's, we can put it in God's hands. Exactly. We do our part. Be kind to them. No matter how how mean they've been to us, we be kind to them. Let God sort the whole thing out. That's, that's a good point. Because how many times have you seen someone who's been angry for years, they're eat up with that anger. They're, they're, they're eaten up inside with those feelings. Just let God handle it in the, in the end. Yeah, it's a good comment. Appreciate that. And short comment too. Um, that's all I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Richard. <laughs> I was just going to say, some people do misapply that and will carry that into the idea of the state also does not uh, have the right to avenge something. And uh, that's not the case. We're talking about our individual uh, yeah. actions here, not uh, the law uh, taking and doing what it's supposed to do, which is to punish people. And sometimes, and we can get into a more complex discussion probably of the difference between punishment and vengeance, you know. Um, But ultimately, Romans 13, God gives the sword to the governments. That's their purview to rule over our lives. And sometimes it's not to our betterment. Sometimes it is. It just depends. That's a good point. Mary? Bitterness, that's the term I was looking for earlier. What wasn't what popping in. Yeah. It's a good point. It's a very good point. Um, Mike. Mm-hmm. I was just going to say, I, mean, I think it uh, shows the wisdom of God because he knows human nature. And he knows the fact that when we you know, are told to buffet our bodies, you know, for many people we see in the news, the level of vengeance sometimes takes you know, to the very extreme. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody cuts you off in traffic the next thing you know, somebody's dead. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, you know, for, for many people, I think just being able to control their emotions and their anger, you know, it's a, it just kind of speaks to the, you know, if somebody hits you and you hit them back, well, then it's kind of evil. But then if somebody hits you, you pull a gun and shoot them, and it's, you know, you see the, the inequality of that. 
Ephesians 4, be angry and sin not. Do not let sin go down upon your wrath nor give place to the devil. Yeah, that's right. That's a good point, Mike. Any other thoughts? I'm sure, uh, Mike, or Brian, if you got a comment, go ahead. Hey, I, I, I heard you laugh. <laughs> <laughs> We're doing good. We've already made six verses in this chapter. We did look at them last week, but we're okay. So with that being said, let's go ahead and then uh, continue past the opening of the seventh seal. Starting here now in verse number seven, let's go ahead and look at a brief overview of these things there. So you see on the chart behind me there, there are seven trumpets that will sound between the start of this chapter or verse seven here and chapter 11. Seven different trumpets are going to sound. Now, you're looking at the overview here. The first one, when it sounds, a third of the trees and the grass will be struck. Then the second trumpet sounds. The sea will be struck. Third trumpet, rivers and springs will be struck. The fourth one, the sun, moon, and stars will be struck. Now, of all of these, if you kind of do a quick look ahead there on the text, and like I said, we'll be getting into this a little bit more here in a little bit. Um, but you'll notice that of each of these, of these beginning with the fourth, the, the first one there, you have a third of the trees like being burned up. The, trump, the second trumpet, a third of the living creatures in the sea die. When you hit verse number 10 regarding the third trumpet, third of the rivers of the springs of water. Fourth trumpet, third of the stars, third of the, uh, of, of the light was dark and a third of the night. And so when you kind of see this opening up, much like with the opening of the four seals being different than the other three seals, we've kind of talked about that leading up to that. Here you have the first four trumpets blowing, issuing a warning, and in each of these, a third. Whatever the focus of the warning is, the consequence, um, the, the damage, the devastation, it's only a third. It is incomplete. This is not a complete and total destruction, but it is elements of the warning. Then you get after those, the pit's going to be open. You have the deadly locust being released. The sixth trumpet, you'll have four angels. They went to kill a third of mankind. And the seventh trumpet, you have victory of Christ and the temple of God opened. Now, there are a number of ways that people look at these trumpets. Even um, some who take the, 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 the futurist tense, which are looking for things in today's time to say, this is it. I remember a couple of years ago, might have been 2020, maybe 2021, when we had, there was a drought, the rivers Euphrates was drying up, it looked like. People were saying, well, here comes the four angels or four beasts, depending on your translation there. People are always looking around. But, and then if you take kind of a, an earlier approach, um, Arthur Ogden in his book, he looks at each of these trumpets and through his studies with Joseph, about Josephus' writings, he tries to line up with specific events with the Roman army coming into Jerusalem. And, and so he tries to line up specific events. The other side is that these are very fig, um, ap uh, apocalyptic imagery of God's warning of the judgment that's going to come. And more, I say warnings, it's really warnings against those who do not have the seal of God upon their forehead. The ones who have not submitted unto him, the ones who have not served him. These are all warnings about what is to come leading up to the victory of Christ and then the temple of God being open. Now, kind of, let's, let's, we, we've got a little mud in the water. Let's really stir it up a little bit so we can't see through it. Um, it could be that if you think about the Lord establishing the church on the day of Pentecost, we see the kingdom of heaven now being at hand before the death of Christ. Um, the kingdom was at hand after the death of Christ. The kingdom was present. You see in the teachings of the apostles that that is very clear. It very well could be that this is all symbolic of ultimately what Joel describes in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 to 32. Um, God's victory, Christ's victory and the establishment of the kingdom. Remember that many of the parables says kingdom of heaven is likened unto. And when you look at that, it's the idea of once the kingdom is established, the church, here's the type of person. Here's what is needed to enter into that kingdom. Or, and, or, it could also be, or in conjunction with the same victory that comes at the end. Okay. 
when we are eternally with God in heaven and the world is no more. So what I like to do with these is view them fundamentally, and we'll look at a few details as we're able to, as warnings of God's judgment to come, whether it's to come for our future generations, the final coming of the Lord, or his judgment against Israel for having rejected his teachings and coincide this with Jeremiah 31, the taking away the old covenant, establishing the new covenant. Hebrews 8 refers to that as well. It could either way, whether you're talking about that day that uh, Joel said was going to happen and Peter says has happened or is happening, or the day the Lord comes again, the point is the same. God warns, man's judgment is near, the victory belongs to God. And so we'll kind of, kind of, kind of take at least, if nothing else, that takeaway to reassure us um, that we, being children of God, are in the kingdom today. And if we remain faithful to the Lord, the ultimate victory will be eternity with God in heaven. But we have overcome today. Any thoughts or comments about that? Right. Thank you for is, you know, this is apocalyptic literature that's kind of hard to, like you're saying, it's difficult to know exactly what he's talking about. Timeline where he's talking about. Um, in the Old Testament, when they were dealing with uh, prophecies about the Messiah, they also had that struggle. And they weren't saved yet. You know, they were looking forward to being saved, but they didn't. But we're saved. So I don't feel as much pressure to, uh, you know, have to be so prepared to get this, you know, to be looking out for. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, they they had to look for a savior to come and save them. You know, we've already got that. You know, I mean, I, we don't have to stress about understanding this perfectly as far as, like, uh, to prepare for the problem, you know, something yeah. to come again that we got to react to in order to be saved, et cetera. Type of deal. Does that make sense? Okay. It does. I understand what you're saying. It's interesting. It says that because a lot of us members of the body of Christ, we forget that the battle's already been fought and yeah. God's already victorious and we are part of his victory. And we need to be assured of that with a really good comment. Thank you. You don't have to say it too much or too loud. It really works. But it's good to be reminded yeah. of these things. It really is. It really is. Because you know, I remember a lot of preaching preachers when I was young especially it's almost like we've got to be living our lives on pins and needles, always looking over our shoulder for the Lord to come again. The reality is we need to live faithfully. Um, if you, and, and several times the analogy of the thief coming in the night is used not in reference to faithful Christians watching, but those who aren't prepared. You know, the, the ones who are striving to serve the Lord, we strive to walk in his fellowship so that when he does come, doesn't matter when. When he does come, we will be with him. Yeah. Chapter 12, verse 12. That victory is already portrayed in our text for us as a reminder and to those Christians this was written to so that they stay focused on that. Yeah. That's a good point. Good point. Don't be afraid of what man can do to you because you've already won. Yeah. Any thoughts or comments, Richard? Uh, say, I think that uh, I remember hearing. Brother Bonner, uh, the older, his first name, David. Mm -hmm. uh, 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 he uh, taught a study on Revelation, and that was also a view that made sense: is that all of these things, these calamities, the bowls of wrath, things like that, are warnings to mankind of the prayer of life, uh, and yeah. that the wise person will take that to heart and realize that it can be snuffed out in a moment's notice. That's a good point. That's a good point. All right. Any other thoughts? All right. So now that's the overview. That would take us into the end of chapter 11. So let's roll back now and let's start with the first trumpet. Let's read through this. And I'll tell you what, I've got it. Let's go ahead and read through the end of the chapter and then we'll kind of step back and, and kind of discuss each one real quick. The first angel sounded and hell and fire followed, mingled with blood and they were thrown into the earth. And a third of the trees were burned up and all green grass was burned up. Then the second angel sounded 
And something like a great mountain burning with fire was thrown into the sea. And a third of the sea became blood, and a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Then, verse number 10, third trumpet. Then the third trumpet sounded, and a great star fell from heaven, burning like a torch. And it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, or, or bitter. And many men died from the water because it was made bitter. And then the fourth trumpet. Then the fourth angel sounded, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon and a third of the stars, so that a third of them were darkened. A third of the day did not shine, and likewise the night. And I looked and I heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven, saying, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the remaining blast of the trumpet of the three angels who are about to sound. Okay, so there is something that is very consistent when you look at each of these four trumpets. See if we see a connection there, similarity. Um, verse number 13. No, I'm so sorry. Bear with me a second. Mm, okay, what I bet say is not completely accurate. So let's back up. You'll, I'll kind of build up what I was talking about. Where, in John's vision, where do these things that are happening to the earth and on the earth, where do these things originate from? From above, okay? You think about it, he says, the first angel sounded and hell and fire followed, mingled with blood, and a third were, th were what? Thrown to the earth. So kind of think about this, when you hear these trumpets sound, in the imagery there, it is God with the angels in the vision here, casting these elements of destruction in a very limited form, of course, upon the earth. Um, when you go back, and although the context is a little bit different, when you look at a couple of Daniel's prophecies we saw when, when, we, when we studied through there, when Daniel was looking up, he would see the heavenly scene. And then when Daniel would look down, he would see the earthly scene, whether it be uh, someone rising up out of the river or, the, or, or the, the river there. And that someone was someone that something that was going to be punished by God and the punishments by God came from above. So when these trumpet sounds, all of the source of all of this destruction that is about to happen is coming from the heavenly realm with the heavenly authority um, ordered or so ordered by God. Now, in this case, what does he first say is being destroyed? Think about vegetation. Third of the trees, a uh, third of the grass. Well, actually, he says all the green grass was burned up. So, God would... It may sound like I'm rambling and, and still kind of wrap my brain around some of this. When you look at the Old Testament Psalms... Um, one of the things that's emphasized is God's power over everything. Not just life, but every single thing on the earth. Every blade of grass, every flower, you know, every tree, every er, er, small, down to the very smallest of forms of life, if you would, that we have. God is in control over all of it. So if God makes the decision to terminate, to, to bring this destruction down, he has the right to do that and the force and the power to do that. All of the, the sounds of these trumpets are leading up to their warnings, leading up to something that's going to happen. And with each one, we, pe mankind, if you would, pay attention to what was happening here to see. We already know that when the sixth seal was open, matter of fact, let's turn back there for just a minute. Turn back over to Revelation chapter 6. There at the very end of this, there were some who were smart enough to recognize things were not going to go well. Revelation chapter 6 there, in verse 12, he introduces when he opened the sixth seal. All right, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black. The full moon became like blood. Stars of the sky filled to the earth. The fig tree sheds its winter fruit. When shaken uh, like as the fig tree sheds its winter fruit, the sky vanished like a scroll that's being rolled up. Every mountain and island was removed from its place. Then notice, here's the point, verse 15 and 16. Then the kings of the earth 
and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone slave and free hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks in the mountains, calling on the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb for the great day of the wrath has come and who can stand. But when you go forward and I'm drawing a blank now, um, uh, maybe chapter 16. Anyway, you're going to see great persecution come from the Lord and those who are witnessing it still did not repent, still did not turn away. So these are just warnings, warnings that the Lord is going to bring his judgment. And there are going to be those who don't heed the warnings. They don't, they don't listen to what he is saying. All right. Any thoughts about the first trumpet? Okay. Kathy. Back there, I was going to say thing that um, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, mm -hmm. and we're to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, okay. and you went back to this scripture, how does that equate when you brought up the preachers that have preached to you previously versus the conversation that just occurred before you started reading verse chapter 8? You know, because you're talking about we don't have to, um, I think we do have to be on pins and needles. I think we, I'm not that we're not assured of our, of our salvation, but I think we have to live our life that way because of those reasons. And when you brought back the wrath of God, and we have to be circumspect and redeem the time because the days are evil. So that's, that's what I'm, I mean, we're seeing all this wrath coming out on men and on the earth. And when you talk about that we have a faith mm -hmm. that we're assured of, we'd have to do that every single day. But specifically in the context here, who is the target of these warnings? Is it those who have the seal of God upon them? Or is it those who, like we read a while ago, who were cowering in the mountains and hiding because of the wrath of the Lamb that's to come? Well, I would disagree with that. I would say chapter 7 introduces those who didn't have to hide. Chapter 7 introduces those who were not fearful of the day of the wrath of the Lamb. Chapter 7 shows those who were sealed, who were protected from the destruction of God. And then the great multitude of those who were already around the throne. I really believe chapter 6, the, the last part of that, that seal there, those who were cowering wasn't all mankind. I think it was those who were in straight opposition to the Lord and was not serving him. Um, let's see, I've got to, if I can find that one. I'm not, but I would be afraid. Um, I guess what I'm saying, I don't know. I'm not saying fear, fear of the Lord and keep his commandments. Okay. That's not the same for the child of God who trusts in the Lord, who walks in fellowship with the Lord. And listen, these things are conditional. You can't simply say, well, I'm walking in fellowship with God and live ungodly. We can't have any fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather we are to expose them and reprove them. The person who's walking, living their life in fellowship with God, when the day of the Lord comes, they, like Paul did, he's looking forward to the crown of righteousness. Paul never said, at least you can correct me if I'm wrong. He never said, I'm fearful of dying because I don't know whether or not I'm right before God. Paul put his confidence not in himself, but in the promises of God. And if Paul did stumble, he would, he would repent. You know, that's why he said he buffeted his body daily, lest he also should be a castaway. Um, for the faithful child of God who's serving the Lord. And you know, you and I know whether or not we're serving the Lord. It's that simple. Okay. Might deceive ourselves, but fundamentally we know from our hearts and our minds whether or not we're truly serving the Lord. So we are looking forward to the Lord coming again. Um, and I just like Mary and I were talking about the other night. There's nothing I can do that's enough. At the end of the day, right. it's the grace of God that's going to save me from all of that. And you trust so, His grace and you trust His promises. Right. And you do what you can to serve him faithfully from the heart, and he takes care of the rest. If you stumble, you repent. They're all in there together. They're not separate. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Yeah, I mean, I agree with that, that, that everything's 
tied in together, but, you know, the faith that saves you, you know, when, when Jesus says, or when Paul says the faith that now saves you, um, we're saved by the same faith Abraham was saved by. Mm-hmm. Well, how does that work? Well, what it works is the faith that Abraham had in God was that God promised that all mankind would be saved through his lineage. He believed that. And so his faith was that he trusted God was going to save man. We now see how that plays out. But our faith, our belief that we are saved, you know, that's a hope. And it's a hope based on a promise that Jesus made, that God made. Do you believe you're saved? You know, there are people that have done a lot of things that are wrong. We, there are people here that have lived a life that, that maybe uh, they've made right, but they have a lot of things they regret. And they wonder, I don't know, I may have gone too far. You know, I don't know if I'm savable. And that faith that you are saved, that Jesus is going to hold up. You know, he is going to be that propitiation for your sins. That belief that you're saved, that gives you that peace. That's what saves you. And that's what we got to realize is like, if we're scared, that's a lack of faith in Jesus. That's a lack of faith in God. Because we are scared. He's, you know, we've gone too far or we're not, you know, Jesus isn't going to save us. And I think that I think that when he talks about fear is the beginning, it is the beginning. But once you become saved, you no longer have to fear. You know, and that's and and our faith that saves us should give us more confidence. And when we are scared, that's a lack of faith. And I think we have to remember that because he says faith saves you. So if you're scared, it's a lack of belief that Jesus is going to save you. And I think we have to remember that because that's something that I grew up being scared and thinking that was okay, but that's not okay. That's a lack of faith. We may doubt ourselves to whether or not we can walk in perfection, but we forget what God has done. You know, we shouldn't let that doubt hinder us, is what I'm saying. You know, we should do our best. Sure. But when you start to doubt yourself, you need to recognize, hey, I don't have to be afraid because Jesus is going to save me. Yeah. And that's the faith that saves you. And I think we have to be careful of living like a Jew and thinking we're saved. If we, you know what I mean? Because we aren't under the law anymore. Yeah. Um, it's interesting you said that in this morning's sermon. This would be one little part. We talk, we'll talk briefly about Peter walking on the water. So here, here's a man who the Lord, he's, if, if it's you, command me to come and I'll walk on the water. Can you imagine the level of faith that it took to take that first step? Aside from the cool factor, if you would. But then as soon as the winds and the waves and he looked aside to those, that immediate faith was not an endearing faith yet. Later in Peter's life, that faith would become an enduring faith. And Peter would stumble several times. But, and we see what he did in denying the Lord. But eventually his faith became the enduring faith that brought about, according to tradition at least, his death upon a cross upside down. You know, He cried out to the Lord. And Jesus lifted him up. Yeah. And I think we have to remember that. That yeah. Jesus, like... You may die with a certain amount of faith, and I may die with a certain amount of faith. You may have a lot more than me, but that doesn't mean that I'm not saved. You know what I mean? Like, Jesus is going to come to you. At where, I mean, he's going to come down and lift you up, and I think we got to believe in that, and that will give us that faith, you know, that saves us. Okay. All right. Then. I think sometimes we misapply the definition of fear. We need to understand that the fear of God uh, we are commanded to fear God and keep His commandment. The fear of God is realizing His significance and His power and His might and how He is so much greater than we are. That fear is not shaking and uh, worrying about, uh, like Brian said, you have, 
you can't apply some of the definitions of fear that you find in the dictionary to the fear of God. You know, it's not a cowering, uh, am I right or am I wrong or am I going to be all right? That fear isn't in the true definition of fear God and keep His commandments. Right. But you, you know what's going to happen if you don't keep His commandments and, and you have to realize that. It's not the best of analogies, but there was a time when if you approached the throne without being solicited to come up, you could be killed. And so people feared approaching the throne. But when the king called you forward, you didn't go up out of self-exaltation. But that's the difference in the king and our king. Exactly. But he but calls us forward. He's not going to strike us yeah. down for approaching him and requesting help or uh, in, our, in our prayers and stuff, we don't have to be afraid. Yeah. He's going. He's going to. We boldly yeah. go before the throne of grace. Exactly. Now, so Dan, Dan is saying, "Oh, what I mean is the fear and the wrath of God is what keeps you away from sin. That's what I'm talking about. That's yeah. what keeps you obeying Him to do His will. So that because you don't want that wrath, that's the kind of fear that He's articulating better than what I've said." <coughs> Um, real quick, we'll come we've got Nat and and Mary and then Mike. <laughs> uh, so so yeah. And I don't think that we are disagreeing. What I've tried to emphasize is that and what's what's been stated is our walking in fellowship is not a walk where we're constantly shaking out of fear. Our walking in fellowship, we confidently walk in fellowship, not because of ourselves, but because of him. Recognizing that if we do stumble, we need to correct that. We need to repent and turn back to the Lord. But we're walking in this walk because two reasons. We love the Lord with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and we don't want to be the recipients of the wrath of God. You know, I, I think both those come together. If, we're, if we define ourselves living faithfully because we are only fearing the wrath of God, then it lacks the motivation by itself of the command to love the Lord with God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The idea of respect, very strong respect. And think about a, 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 the child-parent relationship, the child who fully respects their parents will walk according to the parent's instructions out of respect, but out of love as well. Yeah. Um, and that's a good point, Kathy. Dan's good point as well. Um, we got, well, Mike then withdrew his comment. Can you make it quick? Okay. Um, just to kind of tie in a couple of things that I think Brian said and Dan said, you know, in how many times in the gospel does Jesus, of the stories that we have recounted, has he faulted his disciples and identified their fear as their lack of faith? Yeah. Many times. Many times. And then it makes me think of the parable when Brian's talking about, you know, how do you assess the level of faith. Well, Jesus says, you just need the faith the size of mustard seed. You'll move this mountain. Because it's the object of your faith. Is what is, that is what the power lies in. Right? Okay. Not the quantity that we deem to have. And we all hope to be full of faith. But Jesus said, just the size of mustard seed is a faith in me. In that mountain, you will move it. And... Um, so that just kind of speaks to the power of faith. And then the second thing, I think you're perfectly, that's perfectly true. We all believe that our faith in Christ must be voluntary. It's not coerced by any means, right? And of course, you know, um, you know, the governments and kings of the world, they use fear, you know. That's, that, is, that is their method of ensuring compliance. And, uh, and that's not, and our God, many times over, says that his methods are not the world's methods, and particularly okay. in that one, right? So. All right? Good point. This is a record class. We're going to start with chapter 9 next week after we review just a few things for chapter 8. Just because of, of what we're looking at here. Okay. We're going to forego Mary. If you remember it till next week, then I'll call on you first. If I remember to call on you first. Appreciate your participation in the comments.